good evening or good afternoon wherever you are joining us hope um, you can hear us and you can see us it's approximately 10 o'clock in england and we have a guest from the states jay hello jay smith here in the on the east coast I'm five hours behind you, so it's five o'clock in the after, well, early evening for us. Okay, Thank have you. a good early evening over there. Well, Come we're on. finally getting a cooler day. We've gone through a huge heat wave here. I understand you're having the same problem there in England yeah. or London. Can you give me permission to be recorded in this live stream? Yes, absolutely. Uh, so what did you do? to send us this heat wave jay it's very uncomfortable here i'm not gonna take we're not gonna take credit for your heat wave you guys make your own heat all we do is we sit there and have to shoulder on and we don't complain like you seem to all complain it's but that, really I, bad. I think that's an industry there in britain it's bad 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 so we are not looking after god's creation well therefore we see the problems with the weather Anyway, um, thank you for making time and uh, being with us. So last week we um, talked about the second Quran and tonight uh, we want to continue and talk about actually what do scholars tell us today about Quran versus what did scholars told us Tell, tell us about the Quran in seven centuries. So we are just going to compare 21st century versus seventh century. But before we do that, those of you who are in chat, so um, since our topic is Quran and the claims about the Quran, um, can I gently remind you, please stick on the topic. And if you want to get the attention of me um, as you comment the topic we are discussing, please put add sign in front of DCCI ministries that will appear as a, um, it will appear from here red so we can uh, hopefully won't miss it and then respond to that. Please keep your comments in English and please show respect love care and concern to one another so we don't want you to get a bit timed out because you just broke the basic communication principles uh i think that's all from my side so now let's get on with it jay yeah let's uh this is this is a subject that we want I've wanted to do for a while and it's not one that we that people have done that often I know you have uh, spoken about it before Hatun I have spoken about it in my talks and this concerns how this view or the view of the Quran the how Muslims have changed their view on the Quran over the centuries this Quran uh, that we use today this is the Hafs Quran we not really unpack what that means or why that's important but this Hafs Quran that we're seeing today that people are using around the world when you talk to muslims they have elevated it enormously and this is a concern that I, not only i have but many other many others who are coming across muslims who are talking to them have and that is where in the world did they do they get this notion that this is such a great book that this is such an amazing book uh, th there that this is a book that is Inimitable, that's the word that I've always heard. Inimitable means that it is perfect in every way. It has no weaknesses. It has no error. It has no uh, factor about it that can be criticized or critiqued. It is above criticism. Unlike the Bible, they say, which uh, has created all the criticisms, and that's true. When we look at the Bible, there have uh, almost every historical critique that we now know today was invented for the Bible, was created on the Bible, was chosen and and uh, uh, evolved because of the Bible. Because back in the 1800s, the claims that Christians made about the Quran, about, sorry, about the Bible, the claim that Christians made about their Bible was similar to what I'm hearing Muslims make about the Quran today. And there were many Muslim uh, Christian scholars that were quite 
upset with it. And they, uh, for good reasons, decided to hold the Christian scholars uh, responsible for the claims they were making. And they were especially out of the German school in Tübingen, uh, there in uh, Germany, men like Wellhausen and others, who started criticizing or critiquing the Bible from a historical standpoint. And saying, listen, many of the claims that you Christian scholars are making in seminaries and Bible schools and from church pulpits and whatnot cannot stand up to evidence, cannot stand up to the historical evidence and also the literary literature, literature evidence and also what we know as the source evidence, redactic evidence that we're now applying to it in our universities. That began the, the whole pro pro promise or process of what we now know today as historical criticism it began with the Bible and now it's been applied to other texts, to other books, to other scriptures. So here, what we're going to, what I like to do is take that same query that the Christian scholars had in the 1800s and apply it to the Quran, to this book today in the 21st century, because we have now the benefit of all that historical critique because we have the benefit of that criticism that critical analysis uh, of at least almost coming up to 200 years now behind us we can take the apparatus that was created by the germans brought over into europe was then embellished by the british made its way over to the united states to australia and to other parts of the english-speaking world which and has become quite normal within most every uh, every faculty of higher learning this idea of critiquing the claims that religious people make about their religious books. Now, we're doing it with the Quran because both Hatun, you and I are Islamists, are we not? Um, I am simple Christian who wants Muslims to give up Islam and bow down to Lord Jesus Christ because they are going to end up in hell if that doesn't happen. That, okay. Oh, yes, we do critique Islam for that. Okay, and so an Islamicist is someone from outside who studies Islam, which you are, am I correct? Yeah. You're not a Muslim today who is studying uh, Islam from within Islam. No, thanks God not. And so an Islamicist is like you and me. You used to be a Muslim. I never was a Muslim. Uh, we are both uh, outside of Islam. We are looking at Islam, and our area of expertise is Islam. Am I correct? Uh, yeah, I'm the I'm engaging with Muslims uh, by dealing with Islam. But you don't you don't you wouldn't call yourself an expert on Jehovah Witnesses or Mormons or atheists or humanists, though you have opinions about them. Your area of expertise is really Islam, and that's yeah. what I'm getting at. Yeah. yeah. That's why? From an Islamist standpoint, for those who, uh, let me define terms, an Islamist is a Muslim who's an expert on Islam. An Islamicist is a non-Muslim who's an expert on Islam. And both Hatun and I, we have been, uh, we are experts on Islam. I've spent almost 40 years studying it, engaging with it publicly, uh, having debates with Muslims about it, and I still do that today. Hatun, how many years have you, would you say you have engaged with Islam publicly? Um... Oh, well, long enough to have gray hairs, but I think most importantly, long enough to help, help Muslims to see from while their first claim was they had the Quran of Muhammad, now they can say, yep, they can see there are lots of different Arabic Qurans out there. So it's been a while. Okay, it's been quite a few years, and many of those years we have shared it together. I was with you in, in, in London for three of those years, uh, possibly even four and now since i've been away i uh, we have continued to have this relationship of going back and forth doing live streams uh, passing material back and forth uh for the last two years that i've left now britain and even when i come back to britain we get up on the ladder and we continue to do that there at speaker's corner we did that back in may or early june sorry and uh we'll be doing it again uh in, 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 uh, next month so let's go ahead and let's get back to this idea the idea okay, that, okay. That, let me let me just stop you there i wasn't gonna ask this but um i just received a message which says if jay is the expert on islam okay what uh what are you going to say about the mosque which is the which is recently found 
and uh, looking at towards Mecca. So okay. you, I think they are assuming as a, a Islam expert, you should be up to date with the arguments and now this newly founded mosque just simply destroys what have you have been saying alongside of Dan Gibson. Okay, and let's go ahead to that. And let's I, I'm just gonna go up to I'm just keep talking a little bit about while I bring up that mosque so I can picture so people can picture it and see it. And it has okay. even though that, that's not our conversation, but when someone just sends that through different channels, it appears on the screen. So therefore um, we just want to see if Dr. J. Smith, who claims to be the expert on Islam, still expert on Islam, since it was last week on the news that um, they find uh, one of the um, early dated mosques, around 700, which has been facing to Mecca. But uh, uh, what we have been saying is, according to Dan Gibson, when he looked at the earliest mosques show right here let's take a look at it i'm gonna put an application window let's take a look at the mosque they're talking about can you see it there um that's the yeah. mosque that they're referring to now that mosque just look it's, it came out uh, they read the publication came out on 18th of july uh, so just five days ago by BBC. And of course, look at the head title. The title says Israeli Mosque, Archaeologists Unearthed 1200 Year Old Ruins in Desert. Look at the title there 1200 Year Old Ruins. Now, let's do your maths. Today is 2019. 1200 years would put it back to when? 814. 819, sorry. Am I correct? Yeah. 819 AD. When did Muhammad die? 632. When was the Qibla of the mosque, according to the Quran, in chapter 2, verse 145, when was the Qibla canonized in the date there would be 621. So every mosque that has been found since 621 should be facing Mecca, according to chapter 2, verse 145 to 149. Am I correct? Yeah. Okay. Now, this is 819. How many years later are we talking about? We're talking about a good 200 years later. Am I correct? So take a look at that mosque and you'll see this is from the 9th century. This is not from the 7th century. And the writer of that article who then said the remains dating from the 7th or 8th century where in the world did they get this idea 7th century? Have they done their math? And that's the problem with BBC. BBC, the writers and the journalists at BBC are not scholars, not in this area. They've already contradicted themselves from just that line there in the article when you compare it with the title of their piece, 1200-year-old mosque. Now, there's a number of things that are going on here. I went and I, and I emailed Dan Gibson very quickly about this. I said, how you, how you come across this mosque? Uh, and he said in Rahat, Rahat is in Israel. He said, that's a mosque that has just been uncovered, but take a look at it carefully and you will see a mihrab. Can you see the mihrab there? That's that niche, that rounded niche that's there on the left side of the picture. Yeah. That is the mihrab. That is the direction of prayer. That would be the Qibla wall. And the mihrab, if I'm, I'm just going to pull this lower picture up. Can you see where that man's praying in the niche? Yeah. That would be where the man who's leading the prayers would actually pray. Pro, and that would be towards Mecca. And that is true. It probably is towards Mecca. But in 819, of course, they're praying towards Mecca. All the mosques are praying towards Mecca by 819. The first mosque that was directed towards Mecca was 727. That's the Banbor Mosque in Pakistan. All the mosques, however, in the 7th century. Now, re, le, 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 uh, listen to what I'm saying carefully, the Muslim that's asking. Every mosque in the 7th century that has been discovered. And Dan Gibson is the only one that has gone to every one of these mosques, physically been there, and has actually found the GPS coordinates. He has not used Google Earth. Uh, he used Aster, which is the most sophisticated form of GPS put out by the Japanese uh, that finds exact coordinates. He is the only one that went physically to every one of these mosques, all the earliest mosques there in the seventh century. And he found the GPS coordinates for every one of them facing, not Mecca, they were facing Petra. 
up until 706. That's the eight, early 8th century. 706 is the 8th century. Then a new Qibla was introduced, what they call the between Qibla. It's between almost exactly halfway between Mecca and halfway between uh, Petra. But there's nothing there. And there he found about seven mosques that are facing exactly that one point. They're less than a degree off. That's how, how specific they are. But what are they pointing towards when there's nothing in the desert there, halfway between Petra and Mecca? That was an in-between mosque coordinate. coordinate. Uh, he explains all that brilliantly What if you want to read his book or see the, uh, the documentary that he did. Now, it was until 727 that the Ban Mora Mosque is the first mosque that has a Qibla that is facing, of course, Mecca. And then from that time on, there were mosques that were facing Mecca. There were still mosques that were being built that were facing Petra. There were still false mosques that were being built that were facing the between point. And a fourth Qibla, which was a parallel uh, uh, direction, paralleling the line between Mecca and, and Petra. So there were four different Qiblas that he was able to find. These continued to be, uh, continued to be found in mosques that were still being built up until the Abbasid period. The Abbasid period comes in about 749, around 750, mid 8th century. By 750 then, when the Abbasids take over, they are the ones that introduced the Meccan Qibla. They were the ones that introduced the first Qibla there in 727. By 750, another about 100, about 25 years later, all the mosques then are then being rebuilt. And some of the mosques are just either being rebuilt at a different spot. If there's a, a very good one there that's in Amman in, in Jordan and that shows two completely different mosques. The 701 is facing towards Petra. The 741, the one that's the Abbasid mosque, is behind it up on a hill facing towards Mecca. They're right next to each other. One's looking down on the other. And you can see they have two completely different Qiblas. So by 750, you would expect then all the mosques that are built after 750 would be start to be facing Mecca. This mosque in Israel is facing Mecca, but look at the date. It's 819. That's the 9th century. So what's the story here? What's Why is everybody so excited about it? And why are Muslims saying, see, this destroys Dan Gibson's whole theory? No, it doesn't destroy. In fact, it supports Gibson's theory. Because the Kirbat al-Mijra Mosque, the, also the Dome of the Rock, look at the entire citadel. That was built in 691. Look at the Al-Aqsa Mosque. That is built in 709. That's also right there in Jerusalem. Those are in Israel. Take a look at their Qiblas. They were built much earlier than this little mosque that, that, is, that came to light just five days ago. Those are much, much earlier. They're dated 691 and 709. And so the Kirbat al Manyar Mosque is also dated 706. All of those earlier mosques that are found in Israel are all facing Petra. This one, built in the 9th century, is facing Mecca, which is where it should be facing. What's the story? It looks like BBC is just trying to, in fact, I think that Arthur didn't even know that this was a controversy, didn't even uh, know, realize it, but Muslims have jumped on it because, it, ah, this proves Gan Gibson's wrong without even looking and seeing that the journalists not only contradicted themselves, <laughs> but they actually support what Dan's saying. The Velader Mosque from the late ninth, 8th century and on into the 9th century and then on up to the day are all facing Mecca. No story here, nothing to quarrel about. Thank you, Jay. So... In summary, the mosque which BBC, BBC is mentioning uh, as 1,200 years old, uh, we would expect it to face to Mecca because it would be from the 9th century. By that time, Muslims should be able to fix their theology as well as fix their mosques. So, um, thank you for that, Jay. So, can we just go back to the, our topic. So, what did Muslim scholars um, claim? Well, when what comes they claim to today? Let's start with what they claim today. Yeah. Now, my, I'm still not able to get my screen share acting properly, so I'm going to have to go, Hatu, my, please forgive me, I'm going to have to go slide by slide by slide. But let me just show you the first one here. And uh, this is the one by Suzanne Hanif. Suzanne Hanif says this. The Quran, the Holy Quran, is the only divinely revealed scripture in the history of mankind. 
which has been preserved to the present time in its exact original form. Uh, she said this in 1979. She is okay. a convert to Islam. So we have someone who converts to Islam, simply tells us the Quran we are reading is in exact original form. Yeah. So now that's let's a big claim. Now that could be maybe she's just a convert. Maybe she doesn't know what she's talking about. Let's go to someone who is not a convert. Uh, this is Fethullah Gulen. Explain who Fethullah Gulen is, Hatun, because he's from your country. Uh, he, he was from my country, but he's seeking refuge in the States now because Back of his political view. So he's well known um, Muslim, uh, Muslim ex. He was well known Muslim expert in Turkey. Uh, he has lots of um, schools where people learn the religion, but I think that has been changing because he's got problem with Erdogan now. Okay, so this is the man who has he he had he used to be a a, um, a compatriot, actually a friend of Erdogan, and they used to work together. Now they do not work together, and he has fled Turkey. He now lives here, but he certainly knows about Islam, would he not? You would say that he would be more of an expert than Suzanne Hanif. Uh, he would be more expert than Erdogan, first of all. And uh, because I haven't studied um, Suzanne um, Hanef, so I can't comment on it. But he he used to, um, currently his schools are shut down, but he used to have lots of lots of schools uh, to teach Islam. So he's like, he, he's well-known Islamist in Turkey, Muslimist in Turkey. Okay, now he wrote this book uh, called Questions and Answers About Islam, Volume 1. This was for people who are questioning, asking, and it's for people who are non-Muslims. And he said this in that book, and I've got it there on the screen. The Quran's text is entirely reliable. It has not been altered, edited, or tampered with since it was revealed. All Muslims know only one Quran, perfectly preserved in its original words since the Prophet's death when revelation ended. So here, he's making quite a huge claim here. Uh, it that has never been altered, it's never been edited or tampered with. It is exactly the same Quran today that uh, that we have uh, in our hands today is the same Quran that existed, uh, th th that has existed from the very beginning. I, now, think, I think we need to send him some of the videos we made regarding more than one Quran's as well as we need to send him some of the Islamic tradition for him to read it. Well, it gets even worse. Let's take a look at this one here. This is Abdullah Yusuf Ali. Abdullah Yusuf Ali is uh, Pakistani. Uh, he is the one that has been credited with, with the most popular uh, translation in the English language of the Quran, uh, the Holy Quran, English translation, the meaning and commentary uh, back uh, in the 1930s. And listen to what he says. He says, so well has it, that's the Quran, been preserved, both in memory and in writing, that the Arabic text we have today is identical to the text as it was revealed to the prophet. Not even a single letter has yielded to corruption during the passage of the centuries. Not a single letter has changed. <laughs> that's quite a mouthful right there. Those people in... 20 and 21st century are making very, very big claim about Quran. We yeah. have to see if they are able to back it up. So have you got some anyone else? Yeah, so far we looked at Suzan Hanif, we looked at Fethullah Gülen, we looked at Yusuf Ali. And now we have Maulvi Mal Muhammad Ali. This is the Ahmadiyya uh, fellow that, that they uh, honor and admire. Uh, he was saying this in 1921. The Quran is one and no copy differing in even a diacritical point is met with. There are and always have been contending sects, but the same Quran is in the possession of one and all. A manuscript with the slightest variation in the text is unknown. So he's saying not even a diacritical point has changed. Now explain the diacritical points, Hatu. Those are the like small dots um, which we see um, on the Arabic uh, alphabet. 
That's correct. That's the small dots that you see above and below the letters. The 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 huff. The huff are the letters. The rasm would be the words, the consonantal words. In order to read them, in order to be understand one word from the other, you have to have a dot either above and below. We'll be going into that more as we unpack the problems with the diacritical marks when we get into your material on the the thirty one different Quran, uh, Arabic Qurans. Yeah. So he's saying not. 32, I'm sorry, I'm one behind. You're always one ahead of me. So now it's up to 32. Now let's go to Shabir Ali. Dr. Shabir Ali is a good friend of mine. I've debated him six times. Uh, and in every time that I've debated him, this is what he has said, it are variations on what he's saying here. We have a copy of the Quran dating from the 790 in the British Museum. That's the Ma'il text, the Ma'il Codex, the 2165 that is uh, that the British Museum owns. Folks, he says, that's 1,300 years ago, and we can compare that with what we're reading today, and we find them to be exactly identical. Now, he, this is, he did this at a debate with Tony Costa in Canada a number of years ago. So he's saying very clearly here that the Quran that we have in the, this is the Tashkent one, the one that's, I'm sorry, this is the one that's in the British. This is one in London. This is the one here in London. In fact, that's the one right down where you live, right? yeah. just close to where you live. And you can go, it's not always on display. I, I know that it used to be always on display, but um, they have now pulled it out. I was just there uh, last month and it wasn't there on display. But nonetheless, that he dates to 790. So he's saying it's 1300 years ago. Fascinating that he puts that date. But he goes on and says this. Let me show you what else he says. The Muslims have not quarreled over what the text is. He says, but well, what is important to notice is that throughout the ages of Muslim history, the Muslims have not quarreled over what is the text of the Quran because the text was known through memory work and through the written materials handed down right from the time of the Prophet Muhammad. Uh, he goes and says, peace be upon bless be on him. As I said, the two copies that were made 1,400 years ago, one which is in Tashkent, Russia. That's not correct. Russia, Tashkent is not in Russia. It's in Uzbekistan. So he made that error there. For example, has been demonstrated by Ahmed van Denfer, a well-known scholar there in Britain, in his book, Ulum al-Quran, to be an early copy from that time. And we find no difference from that copy to what we're reading today. So there's no difference between the Samarkand, that's known as the Samarkand manuscript, that is from Tashkent in Uzbekistan. He's claiming it's 1400 years old. So he's claiming it goes right back to Uthman himself and that it is exactly the same as that which we have in our hands today. So um, what Shabir Ali says simply goes against what we read from Sahih Bukhari last week. Because according to Sahih Bukhari, oral tradition was not reliable. I noticed you picked that up. Good for you. Okay, so here's the problem. He is claiming that it's both oral and written. And therefore, if we don't have, if we can't find one one way, we can find one the other way. That's usually is a desperation, act of desperation by Muslims when they know they cannot come up with any written tradition of the text that goes back to Uthman. They always fall back on oral tradition. What's the problem with oral tradition, Hatun? Well, it was it was failed even at the time of Muhammad. It failed uh, in the time of Uthman. So oral tradition is when you pass the information from month to month. But the issue is when they try to put together, all those people were dead. And Muhammad never heard what other person said when they put the Quran together. Not very reliable oral tradition. And I thought I love what you said last week when we brought this up and we talked about it. You said, listen, if it was so good, if oral tradition was that great, if they could if memorization was that superior, then why in the world were they upset? Why were they concerned that all these people were dying off who had memorized it? Why did they not just bring up a lot more people to memorize it? Why is it that they demanded it had to be written down? The fact that they demanded that they had that they had to write it down. The fact that they had to write it down. Zaid ibn Thabit had to do the first one in 632 to 634 under the authority of Abu Bakr and Umar. And the fact that then 20 years later, Zaid ibn Thabit had to write and then a second Quran under the authority of Uthman shows that memory was not at all authoritative. Memory was not trusted even in the seventh century, where they did they would not uh, they could not. Uh, have the Quran simply memorized. They had to have it written down. 
Okay, so he's saying here that it was both. Yeah, the sad thing is, um, Shabir Ali um, is pretty like nice guy. And when you speak to him, you kind of assume he's, he, he's got very too much knowledge. But I'm surprised that when it came, comes to the Quran, he just very, very behind of what's happening in the real life. But that's a different topic. Well, yeah, and you know, I he is the of all the debaters I've debated, he's my favorite because the, because he is a nice guy. He's winsome. Uh, he does not uh, slag off people's personality. He doesn't use ad hominem. He doesn't assassinate people's character. He will come down and shut you down if you say something that doesn't make sense. He's very good at that, and uh, he does it very well. And uh, he, he that uh, is perfectly acceptable. I don't have a problem with that. But I don't like about a lot of Muslim debaters is they tend to when they run out of material they then to fall back on ad hominem on character assassination and they start attacking the person rather than the material shabir ali doesn't do that but nonetheless let's go back and let's now look at what they let's conclude with what they have found and here are the conclusions that i find from these scholars now these are modern day scholars we have chosen them because they are well known in the muslim world i didn't choose except for Suzanne Hanif, maybe now she's she's may not be as well known, but the others are all well known. Gulen's well known. They are all Muslims, and they are all commenting the Quran. Okay, let's summarize what they say. So, what do they all the modern Muslim scholars agree upon? Number one, that the Quran we have today has not changed one iota since its inception. That means it hasn't changed at all. It's still exactly the same Quran today. That has always been, according to every one of the ones that we looked at, that not even a word has changed, that not even a letter has changed. Malvi, uh, uh, Ma uh, Maldudi, uh, not Maldudi, uh, 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 Ahmed said that, that not even a letter or a dire critical mark has changed, not even a dot has changed. That the Quran we have today is exactly the same as that which is on the preserved tablets in heaven. So even the ones that uh, the what we have in our hand today is exactly uh, like that which the Quran refers to in chapter eighty-five, verse twenty-two. That our Quran parallels in every detail that which was revealed to the Prophet Muhammad. That's in six ten to six twenty-two, and then was written down completely by Uthman in six fifty-two. So everything we have in our hands today is exactly the same. That's what they're saying today. But is that what the earliest Muslim scholars believed? What would you think, Hatu? Uh, with my humble knowledge, <laughs> with my little bit knowledge, I would simply say uh, early Muslims would simply uh, disagree with them. And but it is like even though those cl the claims you read it, they come from the Muslim experts, Muslim scholars. We would hear the same claims from like lay Muslims or from like normal Muslims who haven't looked into it. So that's very general claim, actually. But yeah. when we look at the Islamic tradition, what we will be looking at is we will see they simply disagrees what the Muslim scholars are telling us today. Well, let's look like and let's see and because certainly what we're hearing today hatun and we're hearing it on the internet we're seeing it on television we're hearing it in the radio uh we get it in our schools certainly when we talk to muslims on the street when you're down a speaker's corner this is the only narrative you hear that this book the quran has never changed this book is eternal this book has always existed exactly the same every letter every word every dot every diacritical mark every vowelization is exactly the same as that that was given to muhammad as that that was written down by uthman as that that is found preserved on the original tablets that's what you're hearing that's the narrative but we're not just looking at those people on the street we're also looking at the experts and i don't know of any expert outside of the liberal ones some of the liberal ones who will ad, uh, admit that there are some problems there. Von Denfer is one of those. I'm surprised that Shabir Ali even quoted him. But Von Denfer is willing to say that there are difficulties. Now, I don't know if Von Denfer is a Muslim. Nonetheless, scholars are disagreeing with this. But let's look and see what the earliest Muslim scholars, these are the ones that should know because they're earliest, they're the closest to the event. And in the historical critique, whenever you want to go to a historical critique, you always go to that which is earliest. You always go to the person or the event.
that is closest to that which happened so that you will get the most authoritative uh, you'll get the most authoritative narrative or the most authoritative story. So let's go back and let's see what the earliest compilers of the Hadith say. And these are Hadith uh, compilers. These are the Hadith people. These are the ones who wrote down what the Prophet said, Muhammad said. And these are the ones who also give us the story of the Quran, Al-Buhari being one of them. And we went and did talk about Al-Buhari last week, did we not, Hatu? Uh, yeah, so we looked at Sahih Bukhari. And today we will be looking at... Um, other stories from earliest uh, Muslim writers um, tell us actually how perfectly Quran has been preserved, how perfect it is. So this is Ibn Abi Dawud. I have them on the screen there. And he says, many of the passages of the Quran that were sent down were known by those who died on the day of Yamama. That is the battle of Yamama between around 632, 633. But they were not known by those who survived them, nor were they written down. Nor had Abu Bakr, Umar, or Uthman by that time collected the Quran, nor were they found with even one person after them. Ooh, now that's quite a mouthful. What does that so, tell you? So when people die, memo who memorized the Quran, when they died, we didn't have people who were still alive remembers what dead people memorized. So we lost those verses once for all. Okay, so here you have here you have a very clear indication that someone from the ninth century, Abi Ibn Dawud, is from the ninth century. He did not believe, certainly did not consider the Quran to have been something that uh, th uh, that was preserved perfectly. He was very clear that there was a problem here. Now he's not the only one. Here's another one. This is a Suyuti, and this is a Suyuti who is a very strong, well-known scholar. Uh, let me just put him up here. He is a well-known scholar from, actually, his date here is 1500s. But look and see what he is saying. In his book, Al-Itqan Fi Ulum Al-Quran, on page 524, he says this. It is reported from Ismail ibn Ibrahim, from Ayub, from Nafi, from Ibn Uman. That's the, the Isnad. Those are the, uh, the best list of names of where this report is coming from. Who said, let none of you say, I have acquired the whole of the Quran. How does he know what all of it is when much of the Quran has disappeared? Rather, let him say, I have acquired what has survived. Ooh, doo, 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 doo. Now, so, does that tell you how to? Son of Umar, Umar is the second caliph, tells us, okay, people don't say we've got the whole Quran. We, most of Quran is lost we have what is survived we have leftover quran and this is the son of the caliph is telling the mankind do not say we've got the whole quran and he's also saying those things to the scholars we are we ju Jay just um give us the quotations we don't have the whole quran we have what is left over from alive people. What has survived. And that's yeah. what's fascinating because here, as you can see, he's saying when much of the Quran has appeared, he's not saying some of it. He's not saying a little of it. He's not saying a tiny portion of it. He's saying much of it. That means the majority of it has disappeared. So he's making a huge claim here. And he's saying all that has been preserved is that which has survived. So it's obvious that he does not agree with this idea that the Quran has been perfectly re, uh, been pre okay. perfectly preserved. Now here we have Sahih Muslim. Let's look and see what Sahih Muslim says. He says, and he's writing this in volume two, uh, hadith number 2286, page 501. He says, we used to recite a surah which resembled in length and severity to surah Barat. I have, uh, however, forgotten it, with the exception of this which I remember out of it. If there were two valleys full of riches for the son of Adam, he would long for a third valley, and nothing would fill the stomach of the son of Adam but dust. So here is a reference to a, uh, a surah which was forgotten by Sahih Muslim. How would you unpack that one? So as we look at, and this is, comes from Sahih Muslim, who just like put things together after Bukhari. As we look at the early writings, they're saying, 
actually no we supposed to have surah we supposed to have those verses into this part of the quran but it's not there okay let's go to sahih buhari now now sahih buhari is even more authoritative than Sahih Muslim. He is the one that died in 870. He is considered to be Sahih. That means perfect without error. And this is what he said about the Quran. We used to read a verse of the Quran revealed in their connection, but later the verse was canceled. And it was conveyed to our people on our behalf, the information that we have met our Lord. And he is pleased with us and has made us pleased. So this is volume five, hadith number 416 found on page 288 in the volume that I have. Can I ask a question? Yeah. So, since according to Muslim scholars and according to Islam, that Quran is the eternal tablet of Allah, okay? Yeah. That means doesn't have beginning, doesn't have end, okay? Why Allah reveals something make people to memorize it in some occasions that people practiced it and then suddenly make people to forget yeah that's right or cancel or forget yeah or if, yeah if he was gonna like cancel that why did he reveal in the first place are those canceled verses are in the heavenly tablets or not no, and that's that's a that's an amazing question, and that's a question that I like. If there's any Muslims listening, if they could please please answer us on it, because that shows that there is enormous amount of difficulty with your Quran. How can is it you can have an eternal Quran that is complete? At, uh, certainly, is complete in heaven. Was certainly sent down to the. Uh, I'm assuming, according to everything I've heard, that it was sent down via the angel Gabriel to your prophet Muhammad. What then happened to these forgotten verses? Where were they? How can you cancel something that's complete? How can you cancel something that's eternal? How can you forget and cancel something that is supposedly sacrosanct and inimitable? And Buhari doesn't only say that. Here's another verse. Let's take a look at this one. Uh, this one is about the verse on Rajam. This is a verse the, on stoning. And it's a very troublesome one because you can see, even as we're reading it, you can see that... Uh, that there, there, the what the caliph himself is having a problem with it. Here he's, and this is uh, volume eight, and it's hadith number eight one seven, found on page five thirty nine. And this is what say Allah sent Muhammad with the truth and revealed the holy book to him. And among what Allah revealed was the verse on Rajam. Now Rajam it means the stoning of married persons, male and female, who commit adultery. This is the verse that is found today uh, in chapter twenty four, verse two of the Quran. Chapter 24, verse 2 does have a punishment for stone, uh, for uh, committing adultery, but it's no longer stoning. It's now a hundred lashes. So this is that. This is what it's referring to. And we did recite this verse on stoning and understood and memorized it. Allah's apostle, that would be Muhammad, did carry out the punishment of stoning, and so did we after him. Now listen to this. Look what he says next. I am afraid that after a long time has passed, somebody will say, by Allah. We do not find the verse of Rajam in Allah's book, and thus they will go astray by leaving an obligation which Allah has revealed. This is actually Umar who is saying this. This is he who is quoting this. He is concerned because he knew that this verse in stoning was there, this verse of Rajam, chapter 24, verse 2 today. He knew that it was to stone. He knew that the prophet did stone. They used to stone adulterers. And what he was concerned about is that when he looked at the Quran today, that the day that he's now looking at it later on, that people are going to say, what happened to this verse? Why is it that it's no longer there? Why has it now been changed? He doesn't say so here, but we now know it's been changed to 100 lashes. So here is a an, an internal conversation going on. And you can see the dissonance that's happening within Umar. He is full of dissonance here because he realizes that this is not only a practice that's no longer uh, being practiced, but it also suggests that there's something wrong with the Quran, that the Quran no longer is eternal, and that suggests that people can change it, manipulate it, cancel it, forget it, and in this case, even have it evolved uh, within the, within his lifetime. But um, as we look at the Islamic tradition, we see actually this, this chapter alongside of the uh, breastfeeding was eaten by sheep. But the... the if let's say let's say sake of the argument it has been abrogated okay let's say sake of the argument because 
we do not we do not hear from Allah it is obligated and when we look at the Quran we see there are the verses which abrogates one another yet they are both in the Quran and in this case Umar doesn't even know it's been abrogated or not he concerns that they are not going to practice it. Like he just simply expresses concern. And um, my question to you, uh, I don't know if you can kind of comment on that, Jay. Why, if Allah was going to abrogate something, why did he send it in the first place? Are those verses are in the eternal tablets or not? Well, and, and this is going back. I mean, this is this is the million dollar question you're asking, Hatun, and I don't have an answer for it. I wish I did. I'm not all knowing, obviously, and uh, I would like Muslims to answer this. Bart Connolly uh, in, uh, asked a similar question here. Let me just read his question where he goes and he says, uh, DCCI Ministries, did the preserved tablets in heaven contain the satanic verses or the Hebrew that Musa spoke in the burning bush? That's along the same lines you're asking. How, you know, if you believe that these are eternal, if you believe that this the book has always been preserved, co-eternal with God, uh, then obviously the satanic verses must be eternal as well. The Hebrew that Moses would have spoken should be there, but it's not in the Quran that we have today. In chapter 20 and in chapter 27, uh, it does not. It's in Arabic now. It's no longer in Hebrew. And also this whole thing with stoning, the Bursan Rajam in chapter 24, verse 2, must, it should, obviously it was there on, on the original tablets. It's no longer there today. Uh, it has been abrogated. It has been canceled. It has been changed. It has been uh, alleviate, uh, ameliorated, we might say. Now they don't stone them. They just whip them a hundred lashes. And Bart Connolly and you have a, have a right to ask that question. So I put it out there to the Muslims. Answer the question, what preserved tablets are you talking about if you can change them, manipulate them, delete them, accrete them, and do whatever you want with them? It does that not show you that man is actually uh, interfering with God's own work? And is that a book that you want to trust? And can you trust this book when you make claims about it that you can no longer substantiate? All of these need to be asked. I don't see anybody answering them. Come on, Muslims, we need to have your answers. Help us here. Give us some answers to these questions we're bringing out. So far, what we've seen is, as we look at the uh, Islamic tradition, um, early writers who are telling us how Islam started, what Muhammad did, what Muhammad said, simply they are telling us uh, their Quran is simply messed up. And they disagree with today's scholars. Billy Mandalay says that. He said, so the Quran is not eternal. It clearly has been changed. I think you're getting the point, Billy. Exactly. I think we're showing that today. But we're, remember what we're doing. We're doing something a little bit more different today. We're not just looking and asking whether it's changed, whether this is true or not. We're doing a comparison between modern day scholars, what you're hearing on the internet, what you're seeing uh, at Speaker's Corner, what you're hearing Muslims say, and what the earliest scholars said. We're seeing a disconnect here between the early earliest scholars and what modern scholars are saying today. So let's go to another one. Let's go to Ibn Abi Dawud, who is another early scholar. Let's see what he says concerning this, uh, concerning the Quran. And he says this, because I met Ibn Thabit said, I see you have overlooked two verses and I have not written them. They said, and which are they? And he replied, I had it directly, automatically, spontaneously from the messenger of Allah, referring to Surah 9, Ayah 120, 128. Uthman said, I bear witness that these verses are from overlook, are from Allah. So here, Ibn Abi Dawud is talking about a verse that was actually overlooked. Had uh, they wrote it down and they forgot about it. We yeah, talked. We, we looked week. at this last week where Zayed bin Tabit, as he was hunting, as he was searching for the Quranic verses, he finds this guy who's got only two verses, no one else knows about those Surah 9, verse 128 and 129. And then he puts them into the Quran. And today we are, we are hearing from him. He says, I, I bear witness those verses are from Allah. There is no any other witnesses. Yeah. Okay, here we go to another one. This is, uh, now this is by the Mu'ta Ibn Malik, uh, who was writing in the late eighth century, around 795. Uh, and he says this, Abu Yunus, freed, men, freed man of Aisha, mother of believers, reported, 
Aisha ordered me to transcribe the Holy Quran and asked me to let her know when I should write at the verse Excuse me for those who speak Arabic fluently. I know I'm desecrating. And that's in chapter 2, verse 238. When I arrived at the verse, I informed her and she ordered it. Write it this way. I'm not going to go through it, but you can read it there on the screen. You can see it's it's different in a, uh, towards the second half as the, from the first. She added that she had heard it so from the Apostle of Alam, and this is from Muatta Ibn Malik. So here you have Aisha, the wife of Muhammad, favored wife of Muhammad, certainly, is asking for the Quran to be changed. What, what's that do? I mean, how does that figure into this whole narrative? And just a side information, remember Allah's view on woman. Remember Muhammad's view on woman and Muhammad's teenage wife or child wife. In that stage, she's teenage still. Is telling how Allah revealed the Quran, which Muhammad probably failed to tell people. So Aisha is stepping in to help Allah, help Allah with his word. Yeah, so it's fascinating that here you have a woman, a favored wife, married to Muhammad when she was seven. He um, then finally consummated when she was nine and he was 53. Uh, I'm not even going to get into that, how to, and that's that's something that I'm glad I don't have to defend. But I, I would wish Muslims would start defending it. I don't know Muslims that can. Nonetheless, let's get, don't get off on a side way. Let's get back to this idea that here a woman has the Quran changed. Now, it's not just a woman, though she is favored. What about the governor? of Kufa, uh, Al-Hajjaj. Let's see what he's, what is said about him from Ibn Abi Dawud. And there you can see it now on the screen where according to Ibn Abi Dawud in Kitab Al-Masahif, page 117, says this, altogether Al-Hajjaj bin Yusuf made 11 modifications in the reading of the Uthmanic text in Al-Baqarah, Surah 2, I 259. It originally read Lam Yatasana Wandhur, but it was altered to Lam Yatasana in Al-Maida, uh, Surah 548, it, it read Shariyatan wa min hajan, but it, it was altered to Shir atawa min hajan. So you have here two different uh, uh, examples of 11 modifications, which the governor under the uh, uh, Abdul Malik, who is uh, he's a governor from 685 to 705, he did makes 11 modifications. He lives over in Iraq. What's a governor, a man? doing changing the Quran in 11 different different instances I would love to know uh, why he thinks he can help out with the eternal word of Allah he never spoke to angel he <laughs> I'm not sure if he even had a chit chat with Muhammad that he thinks he can just modify the word of Allah very loving yeah and <laughs> And then, you know, uh, getting back to that, you can see not only do you have a woman changing it, but now you have uh, Al-Hajjaj changing it 11 times. But in some ways, I can see why the earliest exegetes didn't have a problem with this, because the Quran itself, this book does talk about changes. It refers to it in chapter 2, verse 106, and chapter 16, verse 101, which is known as the law of abrogation. The law of abrogation suggests that this is exactly what God does. This is what God, this is what Allah does. Sorry, not God, Allah does. The Allah of the Quran is always changing it. That which we give, mansuk, we give something better, nasik. Mansuk means weak, nasik means strong. So Allah is always giving verses uh, that he then abrogates but he doesn't necessarily take out the original verses they're still there and that's why when you look at the quran you'll see contradiction after contradiction there's about 225 that we have found contradictions uh, others has found as many as 500 contradictions in this book nonetheless that law of abrogation is built into the quran in chapter 2 verse 106 in chapter 16 verse 101 but it's then repeated by Al Sahih Buhari himself. Let's go and see what he says. So now we go to Sahih Buhari, volume 6, uh, 61, number 529. We did volume 6, 509 and 510 last week. Now we're going to volume 6, book 61, number 527, which says, But Allah said, none of our revelations do we abrogate or cause to be forgotten, but we substitute something better or similar. So here is Sahu Buhari supporting what the Quran says itself in chapter 2, verse 106, and chapter 16, verse 101. So certainly what we're seeing here is this is not a problem for the first exegetes. So can I ask a question? So I know Allah is... 
Allah is supposed to be all wise and all knowing. Okay. If he is going to send something similar, why he is sending the previous one at the first place? Like something better makes sense. He changed his mind stuff. But if it's going to be something similar, why he send it to the one in the first place? <laughs> or I know he's supposed to be all wise, all knowing, all kind or merciful. But when he put his eternal word together, didn't he kind of say, oh, I'm going to change this. Let me work in now and then send it down once for all. Well, Hatun, you're doing what I love. And that is, you're actually coming and you're putting it and you're asking the questions that everybody should be asking. And I was sometimes looking at the comments and you're still not answering these questions. You need to answer these questions. Hatun has now brought this up over and over again. Why, in uh, if Allah is putting together the greatest of all revelations, the final revelations, the, the clearest of all revelation, if these revelations have always existed, then why in the world is he now allowing men, people like Al-Hajjaj, women like Aisha, why is he allowing others to forget parts, cancel others, uh, change other parts of the Quran, abrogate? Why did he even have a, a reference if he's going to change it himself? Why does he even promise that he's going to change it and put something either that's similar? Why in the world do you uh, allow something that's similar? Why did he even put it out there to begin with, is Hatun's asking. And these are important questions. This suggests to me that this is not a book from God, but this is nothing more than a book for men. When men write books, am I correct, Hatu? When men or women write books, when humans write books, we make mistakes. We got to do changes. Let me let me just show you something. So I've got two water bottles here. Okay, they are same. Sorry, they are similar. Okay, so. Both of them are approximately two liters. One of them is blue, other one is like black, but they are similar. If I am gonna send another water bottle, okay? Let's say this blue one, that will be the another similar. There is no point for me to send something similar. Something better would be instead of water bottles, I will send wine or something that would make it better so allah is just like saying okay i'm gonna replace you one of your water bottle very very similar little bit darker bluish instead of like blue it just like it just makes me to question the wisdom of all knowing and all wise allah <laughs> Um, we're all kind of sitting there aghast at the size of your water bottles, um, Hatun. Uh, do you ever get through any, any one of those three water okay. bottles you just showed us? Okay, let's get on get on with the life. So, Am I getting too close to home with your water bottles? I'm sorry. Yeah, I, I've never seen somebody with the enormous ones. The, that she then I, I assume that you fill them. That means they're gonna they weigh over a liter. But let's let's do get back. Uh, let's come back to this, which is more serious. I'm still looking at the uh, at the comments, and the comments are off on a completely different direction. But it would be great if Muslims could really answer these questions we brought up. We need to have answers as to why in the world your God, Allah, would would create a text uh, that that has always well he you would say he didn't create it, it's always existed right why do you have an existing create a cr uncreated text that needs to be changed abrogated that needs to have something that's similar something different understood but something that's similar doesn't make any sense and we're going to finally end with the last one and this is the one that um that it's hatu's favorite that she refers to all the time and this is the one by Sunnah ibn Majah. Hold on a minute. This is not my favorite. This is the favorite of the ship. Ship. There were lots of other verses. Ship could come and eat it, but ship choose to eat the verses, which Aisha was very uncomfortable about. Understood, and I I can understand because um I would be I would be uncomfortable reading this and seeing that someone something as innocent as a sheep as helpless as a sheep could destroy god's holy word but this is exactly what it says in sunnah ibn majah it was narrated that aisha said the verse of stoning and the breastfeeding an adult 10 times was revealed and the paper was with me under the pillow when the messenger of allah died we were preoccupied with his death and a tame sheep came in and ate it and that's why we have no longer have the verse of rajam and also 
the verse on breastfeeding adult 10 times. I'm, I'm sure a lot of people are asking, what's this breastfeeding an adult 10 times? Can you explain that, Hatu? Why are you making me explain those weird ones? So this is the one. So in Christianity, man and woman can sit in a room and have conversations. Okay? In Islam, when men and women who are not husband or who are not um, family uh, cannot sit in a room and have a conversation because they are not seen to one another as, as halal. So what happens is Allah gives solution when a man and woman comes together who are not relatives. Uh, if you want to do chit chat, you can't do it, but you can only do it if man suckles the breast of woman 10 times. That will make me to sit down with a man to have chit chat. Well, I can understand then why Aisha had a problem with this and why she quickly probably destroyed it herself and blamed it on a sheep. Uh, because, I mean, to me, that's just absolutely ridiculous. It doesn't make any sense in the world. Why would suckling a woman's breast? suddenly make it okay for them to you to be in her presence to me i'm so i mean I, again it's just it's just flabbergast me and thank god we don't have that kind of references in our bible just um just for for you to kind of try to imagine um it was like this is not a mother who is feeding the baby okay we are like we do get to see when baby is sucking the breast of mother that's kind of very very natural but in here is we've got let's say adult who is in his 50s breast sucking a woman who is in i don't know from 20 so on that's like two adults is doing that that's like pretty ugly and then when we look at actually early islamic traditions we see allah in one point reduce that to five and then as it goes on uh aisha complains about it because there is this guy <laughs> there is this guy comes to the house of aisha and every time when he comes aisha needs to breastfeed him uh yeah breastfeed him and then aisha gets annoyed aisha passes him to uh someone else like aisha is already uncomfortable as a woman she knows that this is something not right like we, as a woman, we try to cover up so that like we don't put our brothers or sisters um, into lust. Like we don't walk around with a uh, braless or something. But in here, in here, Allah says, okay, open your breast, let man suck so that you can have um, ha happily um, chit chat. It's not even like, this is not like they are gonna marry. This is for them to sit down and have dinner together or ask one another, how is life going? Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm having a hard time understanding this one, but uh, thank goodness, thanks, um, Hatu, and it's better that you talked about it than me, because yeah. it, it makes no sense to me, and I've never, ever understood it in 40 years of having to work with Muslims. Why in the world would you have to breastfeed an adult male in order for him to be in your presence? I, Bart Connolly made a good point. He says, uh, Allah, in his mercy, reduced it to five breastfeeding, so it, uh, because 10 just was too much. But I, it, uh, I, these are things that just completely befuddle me as a Christian male. We don't even see our women that way. We would never look at women in that context. Uh, but let's get back to what we've been talking about, and that has to do with the the fact that in this case, regardless of whether this is true or not, whether this breastfeeding uh, of adult males uh, was there, what had, did happen, it's no longer there today. You will not see it in the Quran today. And the reason why is because in this case, a sheep ate it. And that follows along the same pattern that we've been finding with all of these references as in that too. In every case, there's either man manipulation, woman manipulation, or sheep manipulation. Men, women, and sheep have been able to abrogate change manipulate, cancel, forget, and do all these with the Quran. And that suggests that that's a complete different way of looking at the Quran than what we see what we see in the earliest, uh, what we see in the modern scholars. Just take a look at those the, that I have up on the screen. In summary, we've now seen that 
the Quran was parts of the Quran were lost, parts that disappeared, some were forgotten, some were canceled, some were missing, others were overlooked, um, some were changed, uh, parts of the Quran was modified, substituted, and even eaten by sheep. To me, this sounds does not sound like a book which is perfect and complete. This shows me that the Quran has been manipulated, it has been changed, accreted, deleted by men. Uh, and that's why it's about, it, I, I, I'm flabbergasted that, that Muslims, scholars, like the ones we read earlier, are still trying to claim that the Quran is perfect, that the Quran has never changed, that they, every letter, every word, every surah, every verse is exactly like that which they find in the Samarkand, which they find in the Ma'il, which they find in the Sana'a, which they find the Husseini and the, uh, and the, the Metropolis, the, it does, and the Topkapi. These are not, these are not claims that the earliest scholars said. The earliest scholars were very clear. The earliest scholars were quite clear that the Quran did change. Now, knowing that and seeing that, Hatun, can you now see, as we now move into the historical and get into some more of the problems with the, with the Qurans that you have found, the, the 93,000, are, are you over 93 yet? Yeah, yeah, not, I've got over 93,000 variations with them. How many are you up to now? Uh, still in 93s, but I haven't looked at them like since last month. I've got like lots of other things I'm doing. Understood. Okay, so ninety-three over the ninety-three thousand differences in just the Kirat, uh, the Kirat variances. But we're not, as we're seeing with Dan Brubaker's material, there's four thousand consonantal differences, much more devastating. And it seems to suggest to me that these differences were quite normal. Uh, that this was quite a, from what we're seeing from from these references, one after another, that this was not surprising in the early centuries of Islam. When the Quran was being tabulated, it looked like there were many different schools that were tabulating their own Qurans. And you have mentioned, we talked about it last week, that there were four metropolitan codices, one that became popular by with Ubay ibn uh, uh, Ubay ibn uh, uh, in, in Damascus, one that became popular with by Ibn Musa in uh, Baghdad, and one became popular. That sorry, uh, in Basra, and the one became popular by Ibn Masud in Baghdad, and then of course then you have Zaid ibn Tabit, who became very popular there in Medina. So those are the known as the four metropolitan codices. Dr. Arthur Jeffrey, when he did a comparison just between looking at the references within the traditions, like we've just done right now, just on those four codices, Ubay ibn Kabs, ibn Masuds, ibn Musa, and Zaid ibn Tabit, this, those four different a, metropolitan codices, he came up with 15,000 differences. That's within the traditions. He found that in the 1930s. They're still there today. So certainly the earliest 8th century and 9th century Qurans were riddled with differences. It looked like they were trying to, to create a kind of canonized text. And that's why Isuyuti, it makes sense now what Suyuti said what he says. Why do you say we have the whole Quran when much of it has been destroyed, much of it has been lost? All we can say is that we have what has been retained, what has survived. That's all that we can say we have of the Quran. So Muslims, be careful about the claims you make. The claims you make, you cannot support. Though your scholars do make this claim, I'm looking at the uh, at the chat that's going on. I still don't see any Muslims that are answering what we've been asking. And we're going to continue to ask them. You've got to come up with better references. You've got to come up with better answers. This is your Quran. This is your book. This is your reference point. This is what you are absolutely dependent on. You, without the Quran, what else do you go back to? What else can you go back to? And if you cannot come up with a Quran that is the same as has always existed, if you cannot even come up and answer these questions that Hatun has been asking today, she's been, how many questions have you asked on this already on the same theme, Hatun? Um, just a couple of, but I've got like one more question. Go ahead. Why don't you just finish that one question and then we can start wrapping it up. What, what do you think re the reason is that um, 20... First century Muslim scholars goes against the Islamic tradition uh, regarding regarding the claims they make about the Quran. What is the like main reason why like those people read those have access to hadiths or sources we are reading today? So what is the reason they just deny it? Okay, uh, Bart Connolly asked the same question. 
so the tradition of not a dot or a letter isn't traditional. It is only recent, maybe 19th century at the best. Seems to suggest a political realignment after the 1924 Cairo Huffs, uh, which is the 20th century. And I would agree with Bart. I, and I think this is why we're coming to the same conclusion. When you have, uh, when you have another text that is growing in ascendancy, and that's this text here, the Bible. When you have a confrontation between these two books that really came to the fore in the early 20th century, remember, it was the 19th century, the 1800s, that the Bible was starting to be attacked on these very same grounds. And the, by, by 1905, which is the early 20th century, the church was decimated by that attack because the claims they made, made then they could not support. That then was funneled over and was now being brought over to the Quran. So the Quran, there, there was a need for the Quran to be sacrosanct. But this need, probably you can trace right back to the 10th century. Sorry, the 11th century, to 1056. In 1056, there was a man named Ibn Hazm. Ibn Hazm was the first one that claimed that this book, the Bible, had been corrupted. Remember, that did not exist prior to 1056. Muhammad died in 632. So we're talking about 400 years later. 400 years later, you have a Muslim who, for the first time, said that this book has been corrupted. Why did he say that? Well, because for the first time, Muslims were beginning to read this book. So that idea of corruption was introduced in the 11th century. By the time you get to 1905 in the 20th century, then the Quran needs to take one step further, once go one further beyond that, because that idea of corruption no longer was valid because the Bible had, uh, the Bible, there, there had been so much work done in the 1900s. By the 20th century, when this attack was coming out of Germany against the Bible, the Muslims also started coming up with their own attack against the Bible, saying that their Quran was nothing like that book. See, the Bible has all these problems. By 1905, you guys there in Tubigan have shown the Bible it has historical difficulties, has redacted difficulties, has uh, certainly literary difficulties. We don't have that problem. We are the bigger, the better book. And that's why since the 1900s, you will start seeing this claim. By 1924, as Bart Connolly came into uh, can suggest, then you had a canon canonization of the text itself. That was when this final book was then put together. Once that became the canonical text for just the schools in Cairo, became the canonical text for all of Egypt in 1936, and then became the canonical text for all Muslims everywhere in the world in 1985, by that time then, in order for it to remain the canonical text, for that, that uh, to be uh, seen as the superior, the preeminent text in the world by then, they had to make this claim that it had never changed, that there had never been, that this book and we have in our hand today is, ne is exactly the same as any, as the book that Uthman uh, wrote, the book that Muhammad received, and the book that's in heaven. Now, they could make that claim in the 1900s, and they could make that claim all the way up until 1985. They could even make that claim, I would say, even to around 2000. So we're talking about just about 20 years ago, because no one had really looked at this book to see whether or not that was true. You could always make a claim, Hatun, when you when, when you don't have to prove it. Am I correct? Yeah. Make claim all claims you want, yeah. as long as you don't have to prove it, and as long as no one's looking at it. And as long as no one's going to confront you on it, and as long as no one who is able and capable to go public with it, claim away. And that's why as long as I've been working in the Islamic world as an Islamicist, this claim has been buffeting me over and over and over again. I used to get this in debates all the time. I got it with Anand Rashid when he claimed there were 100,000 of these texts that they could look at that existed from the time of Uthman, that he had one in his own house, that he owned one that could be traced right back to Uthman. He made that claim. Shabir Ali made that claim. We've already read his quotes that the, the Ma'il manuscript and that the, the Samarkand manuscript are exactly like this Quran we have in our hand today. But then seeing no one, no one knew how to dispute that. There was nobody that could dispute it. No one had really looked at the Quran. And if they had looked at the Quran and if they did find differences, no one went public. Remember when we were on the ladder two months ago with Mansur Ahmad, and he was standing next to us. And he says, oh, yes, I know all about these corrections. I've already written about it. Remember when we turned to him and we asked him, where have you written anything about it? Show us one article 
in Islamic awareness that even talks about these corrections. Show us one article written by any Muslim anywhere that even refers to these consonantal corrections, not diacritical corrections. Those are well known. Yusuf Qadri has done many videos on the diacritical corrections. These are known as Ahruf and Kira. Show us one article anywhere by any Muslim that's written on these corrections. He finally was quiet. He didn't go. He didn't say anything. Oh, I've written about it, he said. But where? Where has he written about it? Not one article that I can find by Mansur Ahmad or by anybody suggesting that these corrections are not a problem or they, they even exist. So this is something that's only now coming to roost as we speak. And Hatun, you and I and Al-Fadi are probably the three who are the first to actually take it all and bring it onto the internet. What people are hearing today in this live stream, what they're going to be hearing on your DCCI channel, what Al-Fadi is putting up on Sira International, what I'm putting up on Fander Films, are probably the only ones what, that are actually confronting this question. Why is it that Muslims have always claimed in the modern day that the Quran is sacrosanct, that the Quran has never changed, that what we have in our hand today is exactly like that which is in heaven, which came to Muhammad, and which was written by Uthman? Why is it they're saying that today, yet none of the earliest, uh, the earliest scholars ever said that? They would never have claimed it. They knew it was written by men. They knew it was changed by Aisha. They knew it was changed by Al-Hajjaj. They even knew that sheep ate parts of it that was quite normal because they knew it was written by men they would probably have i but i don't even know how they would have given authority other than the fact that they believed that isnad was strong enough and that that could be traced back to the prophet himself so you can see this idea of sacrosanct this idea of inimitability is a new and a modern narrative it is not an old narrative and muslims need to either keep quiet or if they cannot shut up, then put up. Show us where you can find any scholar from the early centuries, like we've been going. They, these are mostly ninth century scholars we showed you, because that's the earliest that we have of any scholars writing anything down. All of them agreed that the Quran had been changed, had been forgotten, had been overlooked, had been parts of it had missing, some have been canceled, others disappeared, parts of it were lost, modified, substituted, even eaten by sheep. Thank God we don't have this problem with the Bible, Hatun. Thank God we don't make these claims about the Bible. We would never say, would we, Hatun, that this is eternal. Have we ever said that? Um, no, we, we do make the claim for Lord Jesus Christ to be eternal. But can I just express a, a point on um, Muslims are uh, openly discussing those things and talking about it and even writing articles about it. If that is the case, I think... Honesty is very important, and so far, what we see is they are not being honest. I'm not sure if that is intentional or unintentional, but uh, when you are not honest, that is dangerous. And that's what we see from Muslims. They are not being very honest on what is out there and how do you share that information with the people. Well, I thank God, Hatun, that our Bible has been critiqued. I thank God that we did stand the test. I thank God for men like Wellhausen and others who were honest. They were Christians themselves. Uh, they did not have this view of the Bible being eternal. They knew it was written by men. They knew many of the authors who did write the Bible. We still have their names on many of the books of the Bible. Uh, they knew that it was inspired by the Holy Spirit. That we do say. And that's why when you look at the Bible, you won't find errors in it. And you won't find these contradictions predictions like you find in the Quran. And that's why it's good that we can come back to the Bible and that we can open it and we can see and read about God's plan for mankind, plan for every one of us. It starts from Genesis, goes right through Revelation. It is a book you can read. It is a book that makes sense. It is a book you can read in your own language. You don't have to read it in Hebrew. You don't have to read it in Greek. God uh, God's book is such a great book that it has now been translated in over 2,500 languages. 93% of the world's population can now read this book in their own mother tongue. That shows to me that this book is a universal book for everyone, for everywhere, for all time, in all places. It is unique in the world. It is the only book that can make that claim. It is not a book that's full of contradictions like the Quran. It is not a book that has any historical anachronisms like the Quran. It is a book that stands up to every criticism, unlike the Quran. And it is a book that, that brings us to God. And 
not, not only introduces God to us, a God that can enter time and space, a God that can love us so much so that he's willing to die for us, a God who did love us so much that he did die for us, so that every one of you who's watching right now can be with him for eternity if you only accept what God did for you on the cross. That's all the regret. The only thing this book demands of you, one thing, to accept what God has done for you. Bring, let God enter your heart, and because of that, you can have salvation for eternity. We ask that of people everywhere we go, and we ask that of those who are listening today. Be careful of this book. This book does not stand up to criticism. This book stands up to all kinds of criticism. It would be great if we then could go and look at the historical anachronisms in the next time we talk to and unpack some of the real historical errors found in this book. And that could be the next the thing that we're the next live stream that we do. But I'll give it over to you. Listen, I say to Muslims, come on home. Come on home. We, we would love you to come back to the Bible. This is a book that does not have the same problems the Quran has. This is a book that has been consistently said the same thing. We've never made claims different uh, in the past that we don't make today. Uh, the claims that the early church fathers would make, we still make today. The claims that the, the apostles made, that Paul made, we make today. We don't sit there and have to excuse ourselves. We don't have to somehow hide it or uh, get angry about it. We have are been totally transparent about it. Hatun has said very clearly that we are a lot more honest about our Bible because there's no reason to try to hide anything about the Bible. There's not a thing about this book that we would try to hide. There was not a claim we would make about the Bible that we haven't made, that I've been making for 40 years, that Hutton has been making as long as she's been on the Internet and as long as she's been down at Speaker, Speaker's Corner. So please, Muslims, please be honest. Be transparent. Don't make claims you cannot support. At the same time, if you cannot support the Quran, and if this book does not hold up to the scrutiny we're putting on it, then why don't you leave it and come on back to this book? The bigger, the better book. It's the book that I would suggest you all come back to. It's the book that Hattun has always has, has come back to, and we give it to you. God bless you. It's been great being with you. Thank you, Jane. Um, while, while Quran is out there to uh, meet the need of the Aisha to rescue her, uh, for her to go through breastfeeding process and feeding Aisha's sheep. Bible is here for us to know who God is and what Lord Jesus Christ did for us. That's it. I think uh, in the Bible, God, Jesus talks about he is the one who gives eternal life and he is the one who ships his, who feeds his sheep. And his sheep would know his voice versus Quran steps in and then allows sheep to come and then eat the word of Allah to rescue all the females. We are grateful for that, but that's not going to give you any chance to come and spend eternity with God himself. It is only and through blood of Lord Jesus Christ. We are made right with God. Therefore, we can spend eternity with him. Um, another live stream where... Um, Dr. J. Smith simply proved um, not only Muslims' claims are false, but also Islam is false and dangerous ideology. Yet, lots of Muslims don't know that. It seems even the scholars don't know that. Therefore, we learn this information and then we ask our questions to the Muslims because we want them to walk through the bridge Lord Jesus Christ already did for them. Lord Jesus Christ built the bridge and our job is to be preach Christ crucified so that Muslim people will walk through that bridge. Um, Jay, thanks for joining us on another live stream. We will have you again soon. Thank you. This has been a privilege. It's always a joy to do this with you. Uh, this is always this is a an easier one today because we were just looking at quotes. We will be getting into some harder material, more difficult material as we move forward. But listen, come along with us. Thank you for uh, inviting me. I'm five hours behind you. This will also be up on Fander Films by tomorrow. But go and let your other friends. I've seen we've been up to around 150, 160 people who've been watching this live as we go through it today. Yeah, and um, we will see you on another live stream. And also, thank you very much, everyone who involved um, in chat discussing the, this issue with one another. And also, huge thank you to admin um, people. I uh, very appreciate your help. If anyone wants to discuss this topic, 
um, in a one-to-one -one form or um, through Skype, uh, we can set up um, online debate and do so. Just drop an email to info at dccministries.com so we can arrange and give you a chance to uh, answer our questions or defend the undefendable Islam. Um, we see you on um, next live stream or at Speakers Corner. God bless you all.